So last Tuesday I saw Meet the Blacks and God's Not Dead 2. That was one great movie night. <sighs> so God's Not Dead 2 is the sequel to the smash Christian hit God's Not Dead. Similar to the first one, this tries to tell different characters with different stories, all intermingled into one story, but there's one major plot line. In this particular movie, it's about a Christian teacher who works at a public school, who's played by Melissa Joan Hart, who used to be Sabrina the Teenage Witch. But anyway, you've seen it in the trailer, one day she's talking about Martin Luther King and Gandhi. In particular, she's talking about their nonviolent acts towards civil rights movement. Well, during that lecture, one student asks a question, and that's because she's starting to believe in Christianity because her parents, they don't believe in any type of religion. Her brother died, she finds a Bible in his room, and so she starts becoming faithful to get closer to her brother. Well, because nonviolence is brought up, She's like, well, isn't that what Jesus taught us? Radical is its unwavering commitment to a nonviolent approach, not just initially, but in the face of escalating persecution by the opposing force. Yes. Isn't that sort of like what Jesus meant when he said that we should love our enemies? Yes. Uh, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew records Jesus as saying, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you will be children of your Father in heaven. The teacher answers the question in a very dignified manner and actually ties it in with Martin Luther King and the lesson. Which indicates a commitment to nonviolence. Dr. King confirmed the link, describing his inspiration from scripture, saying, Christ furnished the spirit and motivation, while Gandhi furnished the method. Except that that didn't work. Jesus got himself killed and everybody knows that. <laughs> well, so did Dr. King. So I guess it just depends on how you measure success. So despite what the trailer makes it out to be, she shouldn't really have gotten any trouble at all. But this is a God's Not Dead movie. There are no gray areas. Everything is black and white in these films. And so what happens? She gets in trouble with the school board because she talked about religion and Jesus in a public school even though she tied it in with the lesson and wasn't really preaching the gospel but rather tying it in with Martin Luther King because, hey, he was a pastor. This is God's not dead and because the people against religion are completely dicks and completely villainous, they want to reprimand her and things escalate out of proportions. And so the whole thing goes to court, where Ray Weiss is the prosecutor. He wants to keep religion out of schools, so he wants to make an example of this teacher. But because he's the villain of the story, and we can't root for his opinions, he makes religion out to be like it's some sort of cancer. A disease. And that's the gist of God's Not Dead 2. So, is there anything good I can say about this movie? Uh, sure. For one, the cinematography, the acting, everything on a more technical level is a lot better than the first one. Because the first one we had a lot of unknown actors that were actually pretty, pretty bland. And we had visuals that looked like it would come off of a home video. God's Not Dead 2 at least has good acting. The structure is a lot better. We don't have any more of the crazy editing where it is in the middle of a scene, it cuts, cuts to a different scene, and then cuts back to that scene as if nothing had happened. Yeah, I think in the first one it tried to cut to show a passage of time, but it's mo a lot more effective in God's Not Dead 2. While some of the side characters acting are still pretty bad in God's Not Dead 2, and a lot of the extras as well, at least the main cast is good and there isn't anything really awful about them other than their stereotyped characters. And the cinematography looks at least theater worthy. Now it's still on the low end spectrum of movies that are worthy for theater, but it still looks like something that would be put out into theaters, visually. It's so over the top, so ridiculous with its exaggerations, 
with its crazy beliefs uh, could be considered a parody. In fact, if you see it as a parody, you might get a lot of laughs out of this movie. Now, I went to this movie in the theater, so there was a lot of people in the theater with me. And I did hear a lot of laughter, but it was really hard to tell if they were laughing because of its ridiculousness or they were genuinely laughing at it because there are moments where some really bad humor happens. Like, it is embarrassingly bad humor. Kind of like War Room, where War Room was funny because it had a sort of parody element to it, but you know it wasn't meant to be because there were moments where it was clearly meant to be funny and it just fell flat on its face. That's what happens with God's Not Dead 2. So I couldn't tell if they were laughing at these joke moments because they were so bad that they were funny, or they were genuinely laughing at the actual humor. Now what do I mean about it's so over the top and crazy parody because of its beliefs? I'm not talking about the actual faith-based stuff. No, I'm talking about the reality of this movie that it's living in. Like, this movie is in a totally different reality. If the people responsible for making this film really thinks the U.S. and the world and the government and schools work the way it does in this movie, then they are some crazy conspiracy theorists. This movie would have you believe that Christianity is one of the minorities of the U.S. and something that's being persecuted against on a regular daily basis. Now, I can't say that there might be some persecution in some states or some cities or whatnot or some individual persecutions. However, I find it really hard to believe that it's on this big of a scale that this movie would have you believe. I mean, this movie makes it look like it's an alternative world, dystopian society where atheists and people of different religion rule the world while Christianity is the minority. It makes it look like everyone else is like 90% of the U.S. while Christianity is like 10%. I don't normally do this. I don't normally look up actual real-life statistics, so I'm not sure if all these websites are really credible. But I went to a bunch of different ones, and a lot of them said about the same percentage of how many Christians are in the U.S. And this includes all the different branches of Christianity because it's a big religion. Christians don't form a minority in the U.S. They are the majority. All these different sites roughly say about 70% of the U.S. are Christians or some sort of branch of Christianity. Whether it would be Protestant, Catholic, Mormon, all the other branches as well. 70%. We're the, we're the majority, people. We're, we're not the persecuted minority, okay? But this movie would have you believe that it's like that in the news and the government, everything, and everyone is persecuted because they're Christians. It's so out there, so outlandish, so far-fetched, that it feels like it's meant to be a parody, but it's clearly not meant to be a parody. And I found a lot of that hilarious more than offensive. Like, in the first one, I found a lot of its beliefs offensive because even though it was over the top, even though it did characterize a bunch of different religions and beliefs into one sort of character, it's still in the realm of believability that other people would believe it. Like, I can definitely see people believing this is how atheists act and this is how Christians are persecuted and this is how things work. I can see other people believing that this could be a believable thing that happens. But in God's Not Dead 2, it's so outlandish and so crazy that it's very hard to believe that anyone would believe this kind of thing happens. Which is probably why the audience actually has it at lower than 60% last time I checked. Which doesn't normally happen with faith-based movies. Usually, when they first come out, they're in the 90s, anywhere from the 70s to 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. This one's lower than 60. That doesn't normally happen. Maybe some people are finally catching on? I hope so. Ray Weiss is probably the most entertaining thing in this film. Yes, he plays your stereotypical villain. Yes, he plays this over-the-top, ridiculous villain. But it looks like he's having the time of his life as he's just grinning and sneering and licking his lips throughout the entire movie. He was a blast to watch. I will at least say that by the end of the movie, I didn't feel angry with the movie like I did in the first one. The way they ended the first one 
was just so mind-boggling and I just got angry with the film because it's meant to be a happy moment. They're in a Christian concert, they're listening to a rock Christian song, and it's supposed to be heart happy and a good ending. Well, no, it's not. It's not a good ending at all. Because there's a lot of people that technically have a sad ending and an unresolved ending by the end of the first one. We got the liberal reporter who, okay, sure, she's found God now, but you know what? She still has cancer, and there's not, nothing that's going to solve that. Actually, apparently in this one it does, because somehow she is healed at the beginning of this movie. Yeah, the reporter that has cancer by the end of the first film, she is cured of cancer at the beginning of this film, and I find it a little hard to believe. Now, the film, the first one really didn't say what type of cancer she had, but I think they said something about a blood test, and so that makes me think maybe she had cancer of the blood. I may be wrong, but I don't think that's a really easy cancer to cure. And I don't know if you need chemo for that, but she definitely isn't bald in this film. And the way the film presents that she's cured makes it feel like she didn't really get help from doctors at all and she got cured. Like, it doesn't say that, but I mean, the way the movie implies it, almost seems like that's what the movie is saying, that God healed her because she became Christian. But of course, we didn't know this was going to happen in the sequel, and so at the end of the first one, it feels like, okay, she's going to die. We also have the Chinese kid in the first film who went to school because his father wanted him to have a good ex education, or at least that's what it was implied, I believe. I don't think he actually said it. It's been a while since I read those subtitles. However, the Chinese student is continually talking about God because he's in the class where God is being debated. So his father's like, no, I brought you to the U.S. to have a good education. You keep talking about God. I disown you, basically. And so that relationship is never resolved at the end of the first film. It is resolved in the second one, though. Also, you have a girl from a Muslim family with a very traditional father that... She has found Christianity and is believing in Christianity. Well, the father disowns her, kicks her out, she makes it look like she's living at the church because she has nowhere else to go. Is that resolved by the end of the first one? Nope. Is it resolved in the second one? Nope. So she could still be homeless for all we know. Yeah, that's, that's not a happy ending. But she's all happy in the Christian, in the Christian concert. All the troubles go away. No, 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 they don't, lady. We also have the woman who dumped the atheist professor, and so she's at the Christian concert, and so she's all happy. I guess it's a happy ending for her, as well as for the main guy. But you know what also happens? The atheist in the movie, he dies. So, yeah, he, he gets hit by a car and dies. This guy just died, and then right after that, we're all supposed to be happy and at this Christian concert, and everything's good, but... Only about two of the stories are actually good and happy. All the rest are pretty sad if you think about it. We didn't have that in God's Not Dead 2. At least it was meant to be a happy moment and it didn't have anything conflicting with that happy moment. Things are resolved in the second one. So yeah, this is another reason why technically the second one is better in a technical aspect and a story-based aspect and structure and all that kind of stuff. Also, the movie did an actual good job at connecting the stories with the main stories. It didn't feel like the subplots in this one were completely separate stories that just happened to converge by the end of it. This one actually felt like all the sub-stories actually meant something to the main plot. Unfortunately, that still can't save it from having a really bad story, really bad message, and not really feeling like a Christian film, but rather feeling like a film that's meant to manipulate you into thinking that us versus them mentality and feeling like we're being persecuted by the government, by everyone, and we should stand up and fight. All I can think about when I was watching this movie is thinking, that's not how the world works, and oh, this probably could have easily been solved if they did this instead of this, or in the real world, these things would be flipped around. There's a moment where she gets brought to the school board. 
That's when they question, hey, did you speak religion in the class? Did you preach to the kids? Did you do this? Did you do that? Instead of actually explaining her story, explaining exactly what she did, giving her side of the story, she just gave yes or no answers to the questions. And so they just assumed she was spouting religious beliefs onto her children. Could have easily been solved if she just explained what she said. But of course, this is God's Not Dead too, and there would be no movie if she did not do that. They even could have brought this up in court, and it almost seems like they tried to do it a little bit by giving hints of that, by talking to the principal, well, isn't your school Martin Luther King? Isn't that who he's, what your school's named after? Oh, and here's a letter. Doesn't this say that his religion was a big part of him and his civil rights movement and this is what he was, she was talking about? Like, they try to go into detail with that, but then they never really continue that route. Instead, they decide, know what we need to do? We need to prove that Jesus was a real person and that he was a real historical figure. And so it proves that you were just talking about a historical figure in history class. You're looking to prove that Jesus Christ existed? Oh, that's ridiculous. I think that's a huge question of debate that people still aren't sure about, whether Jesus was alive or not. Oh, and then they add this side story that really goes nowhere, and I wonder if it's just to set up a third God's Not Dead movie, because they have all the priests and all the pastors get subpoenaed, or how, however you say that. And so they have to turn in all their sermons to the government for some reason. It's never really explained, but he says that we're going to have to go on a religious war. We're going to have to go on a war against the government, or pretty much, and... <sighs> but uh, I'm hearing from a friend of mine in the prosecutor's office about a subpoena that just came down demanding that we submit copies of our sermons for the last three months for review. Can they do that? They tried it in Houston. So now the government can determine what we can and can't preach at our churches. Let's not overreact. I'm, I'm sure there's no ill intent here. Unfortunately, I think this is just the beginning. You've been ignoring it, and now we're paying the price for it. Well, don't forget the silent majority. They're out there. They just need something to stand for. I'll, I'll admit there's pressure, but I think with time, this will correct itself. Forgive me, but I, I think you're wrong. I, I'm serving on a jury in a case right now that touches on these issues. Of course, I'm not allowed to talk about it, but I mean, the one thing that it's convinced me of is that if we stand by and do nothing, pressure that we're feeling today is gonna mean persecution tomorrow. We're at war. There's just way too much to talk about in this movie, and I can't really say everything. It's one of those movies where I need an in-depth review, but I can't really get the DVD of it yet, so I can't really go through the whole film with clips and all that. So maybe one of these days I will, but there's just so much to talk about this film. But because it is a little better on the technical side, and because I could get a kick out of it if I saw it as a parody, I'm going to give God's Not Dead 2 half a star. Still honestly worse than Dirty Grandpa. I can't believe Dirty Grandpa is now my number five worst film of 2016. Like, it's getting bumped up because I'm seeing so many terrible movies. So, did you see God's Not Dead 2? What did you think about it? Go ahead and comment. And if you haven't seen God's Not Dead 2, what is the worst religious film you've seen? Whether Whatever religion whether it's Christian or whatnot, but if it's a religious film, what is the worst one you've seen? Well, it's probably God's Not Dead. And if you like this video, please subscribe and check out my other movie reviews of 2015 and 2016. As always, this is Bruce Gifford, and this was Just My Opinion.